Okay, well guys, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Ben Gonzalez. I'm the COO of Nerve Systems. And the gentleman just recently talking to you guys was Jordan Hollander. He is the founder and CEO of the company. Um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the new technologies that we have out there and some of the applications that we have for the nerve system. Um, we, you know, as Tim had briefly stated, um, we're focused around getting secure and anonymous data uh, for those visitors coming in and out of your physical location. Um, I'm going to let Jordan introduce uh, kind of the story about how we came about, talk a little bit about the current landscape and the marketplace today, and then uh, he'll hand it back to me and I'll kind of walk through a little bit more details about how the technology works. Um, and go through some applications of it. And then we've left plenty of time at the end uh, for a back and forth Q&A session. So before we get going, I uh, just want to say a special thank you to IoT Texas for inviting us to present today. Um, we're very honored to be here and definitely looking forward to the connections that we make today and an ongoing relationship with you guys. So real quick, we'll just uh, kind of introduce the presenters as we just talked about. Um, Jordan and myself will be talking today. And then um, this is Tim. Uh, he just spoke earlier. Tim is sitting there with you guys. So um, afterwards, Jordan and I will remain online for uh, the open Q&A, roundtable discussions, et cetera. And Tim will be there on site. Uh, to be able to have more in-depth conversations with you guys in person as needed. So if you have any questions, please seek out Tim and um, exchange business cards, whatever you guys need to do. And we look forward to uh, any and all questions that you guys have. So um, again, here's a quick brief agenda of what we're going to get into. And Jordan, I'm going to hand this over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Um, so, you know, what I usually like to do is do a little storytelling um, first and tell you how we came up with this idea, um, you know, the evolution of it and what it really means today um, and, you know, for what, we, what we've built. I really want to get your, your wheels, uh, wheels in your head turning, uh, understand the vision of what we built um, and um, see that what nerve could actually mean for um, your particular um, what, what you do directly there um, in IoT. Um, we like to call our, um, our we're, we're a fully patented product, we like to call it the human IP or sometimes the internet of people. Um, and um, get into that in a moment. Um, as Ben has up here, um, um, he has a brief history of, of, of technology. But before we get into that, um, about five years ago, I was sitting in a coffee shop in New York City um, I was looking for a new opportunity, uh, waiting for a business person to come uh, meet me at, I think at a Starbucks or something like that. And I was watching people coming and going out of this place. The one thing that stuck in my mind was that everybody, little five-year-old kids, their grandparents, uh, people sitting at their chairs, people ordering food, uh, coffee, they all had one thing in common and they all had some kind of smart device attached to them, uh, whether there, it was a smartwatch or it was a uh, smartphone, tablet, whatever. Uh, everybody today, just about everyone today, has some kind of smart device on them. In fact, I think there are more, there's about more than 8 billion of them worldwide, and, and uh, more than about half of them sitting right here in the... Uh, there's, um, I think there's two... Two mo there's two mobile devices for every human in, uh, in the United States right now. Um, I figured back then that if we could figure out a way to track mobile devices coming and going without the use of any apps, without the use of GPS, just by gathering information out of the air, the radio frequencies coming off of those devices, then we might be onto something pretty cool something much more like uh, the way the internet was created, but instead of people browsing toward websites, they're walking to their favorite restaurants, they're walking to the airport, they're walking to just about anywhere people go in the real world, starting from their home and, and traveling them throughout the day. 
this is this is very different technology than what you've ever seen out there. We we had a patent delivered to us about a year ago, actually almost exactly a year ago today, and um, full U.S. utility patent. We're we're filing in uh, many other countries right now. And to give you a brief idea of, of history of the technology, a lot of you in this room probably know this, but uh, to give you an idea of what this is and, and how why we're relevant. Back in 1983, TCP IP, that was the first computer computer really transfer networking networking system. Um, and, and that led to 1989, the World Wide Web actually being born to everyone else um, in the world. It, it's hard to believe it's only a little, little over 30 years that we've had the internet um, in, uh, in for the public. And, uh, but, but that's all it was. Back then, people didn't know what they what it was what they needed for they really only designed it for uh, computer scientists to talk to one another uh, and share ideas um, in 1991 the very first website came out 1993 they decided okay how do we start looking at who's coming and going off of a website uh, so we you know web analytics was invented back then but back then it was just more like a um, if you guys remember it was more like a visitor counter. Right? How many people came to the website? It's that simple. Every website seemed to have that. This website had this many visitors so far. Right? It was a gauge of how popular they were. 1994, the first smartphone came out, and I, I keep forgetting the name of it. One of the big companies came out with a big bulky device, um, but it had a lot of the basic features that we, we know today. Um, then things started to get a little more interesting in, in trying to figure out what's going on on what sites people are traveling to. 1995, log file analysis, um, which was really getting more into how long people were staying on, on individual web pages, um, you know, dwell times, different things like that. And these were just really individual website analytics. Uh, 1998, the first mobile web browser. And in 1999, the first GPS-enabled phone came out, enabling people to actually, you know, uh, not just find out where they were, but enable things like Google Maps and different things like that to actually tell them how to get there. Uh, in 2006, and I apologize for being redundant on all of this stuff, a lot of the things you guys know about, 2006 click uh, optimization tools came in. A lot of companies started to realize, okay, how do we leverage the traffic that's coming, coming and going off of websites? How do we get people there? How do we drive traffic? And then in 2014, uh, behavioral analytics companies like Amplitude came out, and this was really starting to get into where we are today, where um, what are people doing, why are they doing it, and creating these, these really um, crazy algorithms to understand um, behavior on the web. Are people are buying, are they, do they have buying behavior? Where, where have they been searching? All those different things that they do online. Uh, and in 2019, um, Nerve, Nerve Systems was uh, officially born, incorporated, um, and we brought the, the technology that we've been working on for the couple of years prior into the fold. And the reason I give you this whole history is to, is to show you that Nerve has come into the, the world as something that has this combination of all of these things that I just mentioned, except it's all real world stuff. Instead of tracking behavioral analytics of people that are on the web, we're the last mile of that data. So we, we are following people into the real world. And then we can actually connect them back to the, back to, um, the web as well by integrating with anything. And um, and we'll we'll get in, Ben will get into a little bit more about that into the uh, features and functionality after I'm done here. Hey Ben, next slide. So, just to give you an idea of the size of the market that we're that we're dealing with, you know, Nerve is basically anywhere where people walk, live and breathe, and walk to and enjoy their life. Uh, the web analytics market is $3.1 billion as of 2019, and it's growing exponentially at almost 20% year over year. Um, GPS uh, is, is one of the biggest markets with $37.9 billion in 2017, and projected to be almost $150 billion by 2025. This is all of those GPS-driven applications, location services. This is um, your Google Maps, your, 
Apple Maps, your ways, and the, all the advertising that go that goes into those things, uh, and that's also growing even at a higher rate than web analytics. You know, that's tracking where people are. You know, their exact position. You're talking; these are geofence companies. These are everything that you uh, would imagine that you've seen in the real world. Uh, and then, of course, you know, mobile devices themselves. Uh, for 14 billion uh, mobile devices in 2020. Projected to be almost 18 billion in 2024. Again, another uh, incredibly high growth. So basically, everybody, whether you're third world or you're first world, you probably have some kind of um, device that that's sending out a signal and uh, trying to connect to the the internet, the cell tower, cell tower, Bluetooth, or something like that. Ben, next slide. So. Um, Ben, is this where you take over? Do you want me to continue? Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, pick so, it up here. Uh, let me let me uh, let me switch you over to Ben. Ben is my is is not just the CEO of the company. He's my right hand. Um, I can't do anything without this guy, um, and I, I really appreciate you jumping on here. Uh, he's he's uh, the analytical side of my brain. I, I I bring creativity, and he ties it all together so I don't get lost. So, Ben, uh, with that, please take over. You've got it. All right, so thank you, thank you, Jordan. Um, so what I want to do is kind of walk through a little bit more about how the technology works. So the idea being is that, um, you know, in any any given physical space, um, we actually install a piece of hardware. Uh, it's a nerve access point. Um, it looks very much like a Wi-Fi router. Um, and what this does is this checks for signals being emitted out of cell phones um, in proximity of itself. Every cell phone out there emits a number of different signals on a regular basis uh, down to milliseconds. It's how cell phones connect to the wireless networks, um, the GPS signals, uh, satellites, you know, everything you can think of. This is the basis for how cell phones work. And our patent it allows us to be able to um, detect those signals, capture them, and react to them in some sort of fashion. And so what we do is our access points will scan for any devices in the immediate area. Okay, When it detects a device, that data will come through initially as secure and anonymous data. We're going to know various in information about the number of devices uh, in the particular area but everything is secure and anonymous. There's no privacy being invaded here. Uh, there's no specifics about the individual user or cell phone owner that we have access to at this point, okay? We're getting information like total visitors, the unique visitors, repeats, how much time is being spent in any given time period, and then with some of our more advanced configurations, we can actually determine the paths that are taking through your physical location um, and get to heat maps in terms of where they aggregate over time so you can see how people are spending time in a physical location and how they're moving through it. Now we take the same scenario and we offer as Tim had mentioned earlier um, partnered with the client themselves we're able to offer what's called incentivized registration. So what that means is that an individual user can go through and actually choose to register and identify themselves. Um, there's various different demographic information that we collect at that point. Um, we have standard registration with you know a short form that we provide direct, and then we also have integrations in with various different social networks. You know they they get back additional information: Facebook login, Google login, etc. Okay. So now these devices have identified themselves. So the signal that we're getting out of them, we're able to tie that to an actual profile. Okay. So our solution still does the exact same scanning, and we're still picking up the same number of devices in that area. But now we're picking up not only unknown devices, but known devices. So now we're able to do a little bit more than just the um, anonymous reporting that we just talked about. Now we have the capabilities to actually engage with those registered customers. Out of the box, 
our solution allows for um, SMS and email communication. These can all be configured, and we'll get into a little bit more about this as we get into the applications of the technology. Um, but we also have an API, and this is where um, a lot of power comes into play. We've been speaking with a number of different companies, and while SMS and email communication is good, um, it can be turnkey for uh, smaller SMBs. Uh, the larger organizations are looking to do more. Well, with our API, they can do just that. So they can take that detection and our ability to instantly send a trigger to do whatever they want it to do. Um, they can you know, engage with the customer in any number of different ways. The unique thing about this solution is that it's completely app free. Now what this means is that there's no app that needs to be downloaded on the phone in order for our solution to work. Okay? This works with the device hardware itself and if you think about this from the anonymous standpoint, this means that just people walking in and out of a particular location, you're going to get that anonymous data automatically simply by plugging in one of our access points. There's nothing left to do. There's nothing for a user to download. Uh, there's no apps to keep up with um, and constantly improve, pushing to the App Store, etc. This is 100% app-free technology. The other unique thing about this is that we don't rely on GPS or location services. So GPS works very well in a 2D plane um, outside. Once you get to a particular location, uh, GPS pretty much stops once you get indoors. Depending on the construction of the building, it's very hard for you know that GPS signal to get through. So they just kind of put you at the last known position when you walked in that front door. The other thing um, with regards to location services, um, a lot of apps a lot are in the OS today is allowing users to select whether or not that app can use the location all the time, never, or only while the app is open. And more and more people are choosing only when the app is open. So what that means is that if you have an app on the phone that's dependent, you know, the functionality is dependent on knowing where that particular user is, if they turn, if they choose to say only when the app is open, and that app is not open and functioning on their phone, you don't have access to any of this information. However, with our system, because we are a proximity-based solution based on our access points, you are going to be able to still detect when a particular user is near one of our access points and the ranges that they are within that proximity can trigger different types of activity. So before I get into the um, applications, I just want to talk a little bit about the Apple IDFA, the identifier for advertisers. Um, with all the news surrounding this recently, you know, Apple has released all these uh, options now for apps, asking if they want to allow them, the, you know, if the user wants to allow this app to track them or not. Um, this is something that advertisers have been very dependent on in the past, um, and more and more people are choosing to ask the app not to track them. Well, with the Nerve solution, it doesn't matter because we're not reliant on that identifier at all. We make a direct connection with the hardware on the device and that allows you to understand that customer's physical behavior in and out of a location and then trigger those digital responses. While this isn't necessarily an apples to apples comparison, it is a question that we've gotten quite often, especially since Apple announced this. And so I just wanted to take a moment to kind of explain how our technology relates to the choice that a user can make right now to not have an app track them. With our solution, it still gives you the ability to communicate directly with that user in a very different way than, say, a Facebook app. So let's talk a little bit about the applications of the technology. So I had mentioned before that we have the capabilities to detect when a device comes within proximity of any of our access points. 
and there's different ranges of detection. Um, we have the ability to set up automatic triggers where you would configure a particular reaction in the system based on any one of these automatic triggers and then the system just is set it and forget it. It just runs in the background. So we have things like obviously when customers first register, you know, particular, um, you know, messaging that just says, hey, welcome, you know, new customer. That can be, you know, whatever type of messaging you want to put together. Um, email and SMS, again, is our solution out of the box. But using that API, we can send a trigger that a new customer has registered and there can be any number of things as that a you know a, a network solution can do. Um, we we then have all these other ones that can determine when was the last time a person was in your location, um, when have they left your location to immediately trigger something, uh, things like surveys to be able to engage them immediately while it's still fresh in their mind um, after a certain number of visits. Again, tracking those. Um, devices coming in and out, we instantly know, okay, you've been here, you know, 10 times, send them something new, right? The interesting thing about the outside capabilities that we have is we can actually detect when registered users are walking by, right? So we can say, you know, try to capture that impulse by or impulse engagement as they're walking by and encourage them to come in and do something. Um, we can detect when they've completely left and they're completely out of range. Um, we have this concept of a visit time. So you can determine what constitutes a visit in a location. Is it a minimum of five minutes and say a maximum of two hours? If they're over two hours, chances are they're probably an employee or something like that. And so you can set that up and configure that and we have this concept of a notification for a short visit, meaning like let's say someone just came in and, and left before they hit that minimum five minute threshold, there's an opportunity to send them a text message and say, you know, say something to kind of get them to come back in or re-engage them or, you know, hey, sorry, we were super busy this time. Here's 25% off for the next time you come in, and, you know, things like that. And of course, the obligatory happy birthday. Um, so getting into a little bit more details outside of the triggers and how these can start to be applied to things. And what I have here is very much the tip of the iceberg. Um, what, I, what I want out of this kind of as I walk through some of these applications is really for everyone in the audience to start thinking about this as related to their own industry and how you know, there, you might draw parallels to some of the specifics that I talk about here, or there might be something that kind of sparks in your own head that isn't listed here that says, you know, oh, what if we could do this? Those are the best type of questions that I personally love getting because our technology is meant to be an, an engine, right? It's meant to have solutions built on top of it. And so, um, that API has huge power in taking our core IP of being able to detect those devices, collect that information, and then instantly react to them in some sort of digital manner. Um, and then the use cases that you build on top of that, they can be anything that fits different you know, industries. So again, I'll ask as I walk through these, Start thinking of some parallels or start thinking of things completely new um, that could be applicable with this type of technology to your particular industry. And we would love to hear use cases or even just brainstorm thoughts that you guys have uh, that we can build off of. So we, we obviously have customer engagement. Um, we have the ability to inter interface with your existing digital infrastructure, things like your loyalty programs, your surveys, and we can also um, have the capabilities to deep link into your installed apps on their phone and open your app to a particular page. Um, NERV is not meant to replace your existing digital strategy. We're here to augment it. Um, with that detection um, outside of the 
digital world, we cover that space in the physical world and bridge that gap. So we come in and, and very much connect you between your existing digital strategy and now give you insight into the real world physical behavior of your people and how those two can blend together. Um, we have this concept of VIP and blocked awareness. So you can identify um, particular, I'll use the term customers, it can be a guest, can be a visitor, um, you know, the particular term of the person coming in and out uh, changes per industry. But, you know, let's, let's use customers for this example. You can identify customers as VIPs. And our solution has the ability to detect when a VIP is walking up to your location. They're not even there yet. So they're walking up. And if we pair that with, um, let's, let's say it is a hotel or it's a restaurant and we know this person is walking up and we pair that with a reservation system and we know that person also has a reservation, we can instantly alert you, the front line with a photo of that person and say, hey, you know, um, Tim is walking up right now. He's one of your VIPs. Here's his photo. Um, greet him and treat him as a VIP should, right? And as you guys are probably well aware of, industries, you know, in terms of hospitality, restaurants, things like that, um, frontline turnover can happen quite often. And so this allows you to add that level of personal touch, even with a staff that maybe has never met this person before. Um, and it just makes them feel that much more appreciated to continue their business, you know, with that particular entity. Same concept with blocked. You know, maybe there's someone that caused a ruckus or did something where you want to ensure that they're not allowed back. Um, and you can do the same thing to indicate, hey, you know, Ben's walking up. Listen, you know, this guy isn't allowed in anymore. And, you know, that provides instant notifications to your front desk security. They can see a photo of them and then they know to, you know, nip that in the butt right there at the, at the front line and not cause any other disturbances. Um, personalized digital signage. So this is a, a pretty cool thing that we had thought about um, where, again, understanding who's in the particular space. And you could go so far as to actually personalize particular digital signage in front of them. Obviously, you want to be careful of um, privacy and, and putting too much information on a publicly view, viewable board. but we have that capability to understand who is in the immediate area and then drive the, the presentation of a digital sign in that area as well. So very unique, very engaging, um, and as long as you know it's kept in a um, controlled manner, people would not necessarily view that as um, an invasion of privacy. Uh, traffic balancing, so peak versus non-peak times. Um, I had mentioned that we have the ability to trigger customers walking by. Well, let's take a restaurant that's open during, you know, that's open and it's a non-peak time and there's, you know, tables available. Uh, we detect somebody walking by that um, is a regular there based on their reservation history. This is a particular time that they do, you know, often eat. Um, maybe their schedule is different than others. And so you can entice them, hey, you know, we've got some open tables here. Why don't you pop on in and here's a two for one for a drink, you know, with an early dinner or something like that. Um, employee tracking and equipment or at asset tracking. Understanding, you know, are your employees on site and where they're supposed to be um, during their scheduled times. Understanding equipment, you know, is it on site? Uh, is it in the area that it's supposed to be? Has equipment walked off? Um, and because we have the ability to instantly detect when something has left a particular area, we can immediately alert somebody if a piece of equipment has crossed a particular threshold. Um, and you know, if we have a full installation where we're actually able to map out the paths and the heat maps and where those particular items are, we can tell you, you know, hey, this this piece of equipment just left the area, and the, you know, it was last seen at the southeast door, right? So, it can significantly help reduce theft, 
can ensure that employees are you know where they are on time um, they're taking proper lunch breaks etc um, some industries you know are a lot more flexible about this but there's others that do require their employees to be you know on site and performing at certain times um, and then finally you know another one we have was security uh, this was actually a very unique use case that we are engaged with right now with a couple companies talking about things like access control um, being able to identify known and unknown devices so as part of corporate policy you can institute that you know it's required that if you're going to work for this company and be on site your device has to be registered so therefore we know that this is you coming in and out um, but more importantly the system can detect has there been an unauthorized device that's entered onto the campus um, if so is it going to the proper you know registration desk where they're supposed to be in order to register and then come visit or are they trying to sneak over the east wall right or come in through you know a back fence or something like that um, once we understand that we can definitely um, instantly notify some sort of security whether that's personnel um, a system that can you know flag that and trigger a particular camera to get eyes on that in you know a control room um, we actually are talking with the company right now about the ability to launch drones and because our solution could know where that particular infraction is we could pass along those coordinates to that drone technology and then they would be able to take it from there and then launch a drone to fly over to that area you know with a camera get eyes on that and then that way security can see you know is this something that's supposed to be happen or is it not and you know they have eyes on it the entire time while additional personnel is actually walking through the building to get out to that particular infraction so you know some really cool stuff that we can do there from a security standpoint and as you can see a lot of these items if not all of these items require an interface in with an additional system or multiple systems and this is the true power of nerve is we bring that detection collection and reaction technology that doesn't require an app that doesn't require GPS that doesn't require location services but can give you that level of identification and knowledge of people coming in and out of the space and then trigger something else to happen the last two that I have are kind of fun ones that we've you know built a few just mock interfaces for um, and I, just, I, I always like to kind of end with these because visuals just continue to help the brain function keep going so everyone knows the concept of find my phone um, hopefully no one here has lost the phone myself I'm actually quite familiar with this feature um, and so you know it it helps um, identify where your phone is but again it's based on GPS and it's based on the last GPS coordinate that it was supposed to it, that it was able to connect to so it can at best get you to the front door of a building where your phone was last seen our technology can take that a step further and bridge that last mile of data indoors so not only can I tell you it's at this building but if that building is completely nerve enabled I can tell you that it's on the 49th floor in this particular room right so the the power of that detail and that's just a lost phone you can do this with employees you can do this with assets and equipment and you can get to that level of three-dimensional knowledge of where these particular items exist in that space and then you know again taking that one step further with that notion of we are that last mile of data GPS takes you to the front door so the example we like to use is you you need to go to the Apple store and it's inside a mall well GPS can get you to the mall and then once you walk in you often are you know relying on those um, mall kiosks that, that show you just this massive map of all the different stores in there the red dot of you are here and trying to determine 
you know, what floor you're on versus what floor the Apple Store is, and you know, kind of creating a visual map in your memory by looking at it and determining how to get there. Um, we could pair with GPS and basically take over once you entered into the mall. And then we could add that additional level to say, okay, you know, you've driven here, you've parked, you're inside the mall. Now we can tell you, all right, you got to go down this hall, make a right, take the escalator up, make a left, and it's going to be three stores down on your right. All right. We can get to that level of detail to, to complete that wayfinding experience from outdoor to indoor. So, I mean, what we always like to say is because of the application, because this is an engine, the only limit is your imagination, right? With our, with our APIs and the engine that we've built, this is meant to be an, an application that you can build anything on top of. The only limit is truly your imagination. So that, that ends our presentation. presentation. Um, getting a little bit of an echo. Um, so that's that's the end here. Uh, I put our contact information on here uh, on screen. I'll leave this up on screen if you guys would like. Um, what you see here is some screenshots of the Nerve technology. Um, and obviously we have Tim there sitting with you guys that is certainly um, – willing to answer any questions that you have, exchange business cards, and continue to talk about the NERV solution. So I'll open it up now to any questions. George, Thanks. early on you were talking about uh, things you do at customer for example, the retail store. How are you going to pick up the information when his, birth, his or her birthday is? That seems pretty intrusive unless you're reading your progress. Yeah, so... Yeah, so um, this is George. Um, oh, then you, you can take it. Then you can take it. Then you can take it. <laughs> sure. That, that, sure. So, uh, so, um, so um, the, the, the key so thing to understand here is that any personal information with an initial scan of any type of device, that, that is the secure and anonymous identification um, um, we do. Now, if a user chooses to, if a user chooses to they are offering up they some of the offering up something in exchange for and some level of attention. The same concept exists for the sports program today. You sign up for you know you your loyalty rewards program. You're agreeing to give them your purchase data and some of your contact information in exchange for the coupons and savings that you earn, you know, through continually shopping with them and using your you know phone number at checkout. It's the exact same concept. So they are offering to give give you their birthday in exchange for other things during that registration process. If they choose not to, we don't have access to that information. So all of this is voluntarily given by the end user. Thank you. Okay. Were you guys able to hear all that? There was a lot of feedback. A lot of feedback. No. Kind of cool. yeah. Go ahead, Kay. Okay. Um, I've got kind of multiple questions, but um, you're capturing some kind of identifier. I don't know if it's the IMEW or, or, or you are capturing that information. And uh, that is private information that you can use as an identifier. I don't know how deep or how you personally can, but that's number one. Um, what are you using, really using to track? Uh, and if you have to kill me to tell me that, I don't really want to know. But I want to know who owns the data. Are y'all, with all of your clients, are you getting the ability to keep all of this information? And if so, are you going to be selling that data? And then the other thing around that is the security of that information that you are collecting. Sure. So, sure. Uh, so uh, we collect we collect a unique identifier from each device. Um, and that identifier is part of our, our patent that allows us to collect that identifier that, that uh, determines the, un the uniqueness of that device. And then obviously when someone registers, that identifier is now connected to 
a user profile with demographic information attached to it. Um, the data that comes in, yes, is owned by NERV, uh, but it but individually it's also owned by the clients. So we have the ability at the very top to see everything. But if you walk into store A, let's let's say that there's two stores A and B. They're both nerve enabled. So you walk into store A and you register with store A. Then you walk into store B and you do not register. Store A has access to your registered information for your interactions with store A only. So they can see your, your visit patterns and history and, and paths taking and things like that they, that, that you do within store A. Um, store B would never be able to see that information. Um, at, now at the top, we start to aggregate all that data together. And what we want to be able to do is find a way to combine all of that data to be able to provide generic reports so that custom, you know, all of our clients can start to understand the demographics of people coming in and out over a given period of time. So I would never say to store B, hey, Ben just came into your store. But what I could say with store B using all of the aggregate data that NERF has access to with our deployments at multiple different locations is that, you know, there's a 42-year-old male that came in. Uh, this is, you know, the average spending habits of this group. Um, and they tend to purchase these type of products or they tend to visit these type of locations during these times. Um, aggregate all that data together so you have trends and patterns that businesses can then make more informed decisions on in terms of how they're going to promote and engage you know clients and now they actually understand exactly who those people are that are coming in and out and when I say exactly it's not meant to be personal identification information that will never be shared among any entity where that user has not registered but it's meant to be you know in this past month your average customer during these peak times are, you know, this gender, this age range, um, and then starting to, you know, add additional demographic and behavioral information that we collect in an aggregated, generalized format. As for the security of that information, um, we have full security protocols built around our data. Um, our data warehouse has full redundancy, um, both digitally and physically, um, and we do regular penetration tests on our data sets. Uh, yeah, uh, does NERV have access to the client information that the, uh, your customer A, store A has on that customer? Is that yes. passed back through to yes. you? And yes. do you own that data? Yes. Yes, nerve nerve owns the data. Nerve owns the data. Then the private information that you haven't captured. I'm sorry. I, I'm I sorry. as a consumer sign up with store A, and I give them my birthday. I give them the ability to track what I bought. Now, does store A does nerve have that access to my information? Yes, so it's part of yes. so the terms part and conditions, part conditions that you accept during this. And this is no different than any um, standard uh, guest Wi-Fi provider that, that's out there today. Um, if, if you sit down and read through the terms and conditions, which, you know, most people don't, um, but if there's a Wi-Fi provider that's providing that technology, if you accept those terms and conditions, you are agreeing to provide that information to the store that's providing that guest Wi-Fi, but you're also providing that information to the, um, the, the technical entity that's providing that equipment and that capabilities. And so this is, this is no different than that. Russell? I think he answered my question. Yeah, it was more just pick that up and put it in Cowboy Stadium. 
if if I don't sign up to the app, he's still collecting information on me, but he can only share it in the aggregate, right? As a as a you know, fifty percent of the fifty year olds are drinking beer, as an example. But if I signed up, you know, as a cowboy, then then he can do all kinds of other stuff. And, and I think that's what he said. So yes, you're so, you're, yes, you're 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 pretty pretty close there. Pretty, pretty close I'll just there. clarify this. I'll just clarify this. When you when you enter into the Cowboy Stadium, into the Cowboy Stadium, and you have not registered, you have not registered, and it's only going to know as only as an know as an as an nothing, nothing, nothing. nothing. If you have registered with you have NERV, registered with in another location, another location, then NERV, NERV will know it. NERV, NERV will know it. NERV, NERV will be able to aggregate the, the generalized data. Um, but if you have never registered with NERV in any location and you walk into any NERV enabled property, we are never going to know any details about you other than a unique ID. You will completely be anonymous. So it requires that you do voluntarily register at a nerve-enabled location for us to have any idea of who you are. Other than that, it is 100% secure and anonymous for the information we collect. So it, does that help answer that question? Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, I get to see a lot of different presentations. Uh, you had interesting things to say. I've heard them all before. And so my question is, in your opinion, what what does your patent prevent other people from doing? So the difference with so us is the difference with us is a lot of the you know, when you say you know, you've seen it all before and, and other people can do this. Um, the majority of people that are doing similar stuff require an app to be installed on the phone, require access to GPS or location GPS. service or location. No, no, wait, 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 wait. no, no, no. I, uh, lots of people require apps, but uh, here in this room or in this group, we've seen presentations. Um, I mean, there's lots of devices that constantly emit. Uh, unique identifiers and there's lots of businesses that pick those up uh, just as you move about through the environment uh, from everything from your mobile devices to your tire pressure monitoring systems so I'm, I'm what I'm asking is what is it that your patent prevents others from doing uh, to add on to that um, specifically there's a lot of captive portal providers that offer these types of services. What's your differentiator with this unique patent? Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. So our patent covers the aggregation of data coming out of mobile devices, any RF. So it's, it's Bluetooth, it's Wi-Fi. Um, we're soon to launch uh, LTE and 5G tracking as well. Um, the exact position of a device uh, in three dimensions, you know, with, through our technology. That is something that we have a 16 point, a 16 different layer patent uh, from the US Patent Office on. And this, this is something that does not require, as you might mention in an app, it doesn't, it doesn't require any user um, interaction with it other than just walking by our devices. Um, and to the, I, the idea that captive portal providers, I've heard that, I don't know who said that, a captive portal provider is only as good as anyone who's registered on a Wi-Fi system. They're not, they're not detecting anonymous, anonymous data coming and going, and they're certainly not detecting the distance to the equipment or where they are within a space. They certainly cannot track um, a path of a user in three dimensions or even in two dimensions where they are. You know, take a big box retail store. A, or a security application of you know some uh, some big warehouse or something, where exactly they are in that exactly. facility? I'm sorry. Uh, I I heard sorry. I, heard I personally it. don't understand yet what you're saying. Your patent, I understand 16 layers and claims. 
Are you saying you have a patent that prevents somebody from just reading Wi-Fi signals passing through the ether? Not Wi-Fi, I'm sorry. Signals passing through the ether? You're saying you patent the that? To detect the exact location exact of that device, that's absolutely, device. that's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. We're not talking that's about great. GPS. We're not talking about GPS tracking. We're not talking about geofencing. But we're we're talking about, 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 about pulling that data out of the air and determining that, 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 that in that location. In that location. Our patent covers that. Our patent covers that. All right, dude. Had one question on the asset tracking. Since it, do you have to have something on, let's say it's a piece of equipment uh, in a restaurant, is it, do you put some sort of a beacon or something on there to track it, or is it supposed to have a cell phone? That, that's another great question. That's well, another great question. Well, can somebody shut off the feedback again? Shut off the feedback again. Thank you. Um, so we're working with, um, I don't. I don't think Ben. I don't think we're allowed to disclose the company at this point. But no. we're working with one of the largest companies in the world. Um, you know, their market cap is a quarter of a trillion dollars, um, and they they have a their own patent on a on a, a tiny little tag uh, that's a, that's going to um, emit something that we're going to be able to uh, to track. But really, um, we can track any kind of signal emitting device so that could be something as simple as a powered ble beacon um or any other any other thing so basically what we our technology does it instead of having a beacon technology where you need an app or you or a gps outside you know we're we're can we're can, we're turning that on its end and making phones themselves and any other device into beacons themselves so we can track their exact position so in reference to asset tags or, or something like that, there would be something attached to that device if it's not already emitting something. So it's something that's inert, you know, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, a widget that doesn't do much, but you need to make sure it's in that particular spot um, where we can, we'll attach a tag to that and we can, we can follow that around and, and see exactly where it is. If it's left, we can even see what, what mobile device might be near that as well to give you a, a broader idea of um, who might have moved it. Yes, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, is, your, is your system uh, uh, portable? You've talked about having it in a retail location, a restaurant. Uh, I'm thinking of an example. Tonight, I'm going to uh, meet a very large venue. Uh, the promoter of this event goes around venues all around major cities in the U.S. Does your system allow for portability so they can track everybody who's coming to their event, what they buy, what they don't buy, where they stand, and all the other things you brought up? Another great question. So, Another yeah, we, we could, we we have a um, uh, mobile version of our access points. Uh, they're LTE driven at the moment. Um, where they can they can be deployed anywhere and move around any place um, and, um, and and so the answer to your question is yeah they, they can do that um, we can we can deploy multiple ones of that in fact the first um, engagement we had was with a, um, a CPG company that was looking to have a uh, kind of a 24 hour day seven day a week digital spokesperson that, that just and, and uh, Sentry that basically sits on their retail displays uh, and without having to hook into the um, infrastructure of the place itself, basically set that display up and get all the analytics that are happening around it and uh, and be able to communicate with those people in real time if, ne if needed or back to home base or create a two-way communication channel for experts and stuff like that. Um, I, it, I hope that answers your question. Next question, they're going Okay, so, so my question is uh, more about uh, talk about critical mass, and you mentioned the shock and wall kind of application. I mentioned you're going to have uh, I don't know, 50 or 100 of these sprinkled throughout. Um, so uh, what kind of adoption do you need from the businesses within them all? That's that's one case. But bigger picture, what do you consider a critical mass for your company? How many subscribers and kind of where are you with that? 
Yeah, so it depends on what you're talking about. So as far as being able to, you know, there, there's a there's a sense of critical mass where we start to be um, ambiguous everywhere, where we start to know, you know, uh, millions and millions of users and, and that sort of thing. And that that's one thing on a big data uh, standpoint. But but really, it doesn't need to be that way. I mean, if if we were if we were in, let's just say, one shopping mall, for example, uh, we can enable those devices that are there locally to um, to get through that space so we wouldn't necessarily critical mass uh, it would just be it would just be um, connecting to that user now that that would happen in a number of ways in, in the case of the GPS let's say um, you know that would be you know we'd be partnered up with say Google Maps or Apple Maps or Waze or somebody that once they reach that indoor space um, it, it starts to interact with our product and guides them directly to the Apple Store kind of thing. Does that make sense? Any other announcements? Otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gary Ramsey. Uh, Jordan and Ben, thank you very much. And you guys have a good time on the online. Hope you can have a good interaction all. Take care. Great. Thank you, Ed. And for those who are uh, online, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through here real quick and, uh, and just have each one of you individually. I'll, I'll just call you out to introduce yourself and uh, tell us just a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, what you do, who you're doing it for. And, um, and I'll go ahead and, and put this on the front end. If there's any, um, any requests or anything that you're asked that you, uh, of the, the IOT community, uh, please let us know that too. So um, let's see, Solomon, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and, uh, and, and introduce uh, yourself here to the, to the people here online? All right, we we'll see you. Yeah, there we go. So, sorry, a couple of uh, security settings to get through. Yeah, so I'm Solomon Israel. I'm the CTO of SkyMax Network. We are a greenfield uh, telecom service provider uh, focused on delivering 5G technologies into sub-Saharan Africa. All right, fantastic. Uh, Jason, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and introduce? Sure. Uh, I don't think my video is going to work here, but... Um, that's uh, so my name is Jason. I'm the uh, product manager for JVC Kenwood USA. Uh, we make um, two-way radios. We're a traditional manufacturer. Uh, my involvement in the world of IoT has largely been uh, just doing some projects, concept stuff over the years. Uh, now the company is looking to, uh, you know, with the current environment, the global issues, looking to take some of the things that we've uh, help some partners do and some of the things that we've built uh, kind of in a, in a lab rat type uh, environment and kind of bring some of these things to market and do some of the stuff ourselves. So I'm um, happy to be a part of the group here and, and talk to some of you guys. And um, that's been uh, very informative in this particular session. Thanks. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's see. Let me just throw this out. Uh, is there any, uh, any questions at this point that you'd like to ask uh, of the the nerve team because if you don't have them i've got a couple i've got a, a couple go go ahead so if um if you're trying to deploy this along with a uh, a customer that's already got an rtls system uh, how do you guys handle the api integration this uh do you guys have a like a flat rate charge for those apis do you guys try to manage that integration yourselves or do you post something where uh we could work those uh, alerts and messages into an existing workflow? Sure, I can take that. Um, so we don't have um, any fixed rates. Uh, as part of our solution, uh, API access does come with it out of the box. Um, we can certainly sit down and talk about a custom development project to align with you know that system, or you know your developers can take that on and build the connections uh, through our API. So really when we start to talk about that level of integration, that definitely becomes a custom conversation. Hey, so just to add to that real quick, so um, we're, uh, we, don't, we didn't really cover this in the talk. We're, we're what we like to call a HaaS solution, hardware as a service. 
Um, so we deploy our hardware as part of the service, and we we uh, it's a monthly recurring you know monthly recurring subscription basically. So the APIs are generally um, covered in all that, unless we're building something uh, highly technical, and uh, we'll either build that into the price or you know, we'll charge for you know customization. Understood. Thank you. Let's just say I'm a consummate uh, early adopter, and I'm the I'm the guy that's standing in line, hopefully third or fourth, uh, waiting for that uh, brand new iPhone to uh, secure at eight o'clock when the AT and T store opens up. So that's uh, typically March twelfth plus two weeks. If you guys are on top of that, like I am. So what what happens uh, on March twelfth plus two weeks when I change a um, change out my my uh, cell phone? And now I've got a new MAC address. Hey Ben, you want to take that? Sure. So um, that that is uh, so very good question. That is something that we've been working on uh, since the beginning, and I definitely understand the use case where that happens. Um, so what would happen is when we start to detect a different pattern for that old MAC address coming in and out, um, you would uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we would definitely be able to identify that this device has now changed hands and we can flag it at that point. The other aspect to it is if you came back into a new location and say tried to, to access the Wi-Fi network or things like that, um, you would be prompted to register, quote unquote, register again. Um, and then when we see your registration that matches an old one, we would then transfer that um, that account and that history of that account onto the new MAC address um, to continue your profile within the nerve system going forward. Yep. So basically, to add add to what Ben is saying, you know, we'll we'll have if someone had registered, we'll have their PII um, at that point, um, and if someone if 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 by chance that same device walked into a facility that we that we manage that wasn't them anymore um we we would we would um you know we would catch up to that at some point so if the if the end user let's say yourself was registered to get certain communications from home depot when you walked in there and all of a sudden you stopped getting them um or you're getting notifications that uh you're at home depot and how can I help you? And you didn't walk in there. You're like, okay, well, that's weird. And then, and then um, they'll get you'll you'll get a message saying, hey, if you did not go into Home Depot, click here. And basically, you'll get a message saying, hey, you, you need to your device needs to be re-registered next time you walk in there. We'll deactivate the last one. So um, we could tie all that together. In the moment that they register, um, think about like an app for this moment. You know, so if if you know, if you're registering with us. Just like if you get a new phone, those apps come on there, but you do need to re-log into those apps, even though they, they transfer over to your new iPhone. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, and, and, and I'll just say in my particular case, uh, I'll, I'll stand in line all night, whatever, to, to get that brand new phone, and then uh, uh, you know, hopefully within 30 minutes of uh, the store opening up, I'm walking out with a brand new shiny iPhone, and probably about two hours after that, my daughter's got a uh, my old phone. So sure. the last thing I want her to do is to get the VIP treatment at Neiman Marcus, right? That would be dangerous. <laughs> so well, I mean, I suppose that's something that 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 could happen. But um, well, you know, the so we 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 could we we you know there you know I suppose you know we can build in, and this it's actually. A, not a not a bad snare. If you're someone that's worried about it, you're going to give it to their daughter, and, and you're worried about that sort of thing, if it's something you've been using quite a bit, you can simply notify us that it's no longer your phone, no longer your device, and we can deactivate that all that systems in, uh, instantly. We we're your si your customer information is siloed in the nervous system altogether, uh, not particularly just for Home Depot. It's it's through you know it's through the entire brain, if that makes sense. So if you you were worried about that. It would it would just be the same as you deleting apps off the phone and you know kind of giving him or giving her a clean slate of a phone. You would just need to let us know if that was yeah. something you're worried about. I that's probably point zero 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 one percent of what could happen out there, but it's it's valid and uh, you know we could solve that. Okay. Now I was just thinking that I mean if you had a 
let's just say an API that you would make available to everybody who has your system so that uh, if I were to go into the Home Depot app and say, oh, dang it, I need to register me and unregister my phone. You know, I've got a new phone. If I had made that change at, on my Home Depot app because I had that capability, uh, that would replicate through to everybody that I'm visiting. Um, the, the problem is, is that the apps themselves are no longer they're, they're The um, Apple, Apple and Google are no longer allowing applications to collect MAC addresses on their on their applications, believe it or not. So they're actually starting to block all of those as well. Um, so even though you might have a Home Depot app, so we can integrate with the app 100 um, yep. percent, but we may not be able to gather that what phone is, you know, is there unless let's say your mobile number is attached to the app, then, you know, we can we can cross cross that with the PI that we have on our side and we can say, oh, OK, this is this is uh, this user. Right. OK. Um, and there's another question I've got. Um, can you go over just what it takes to, to get the, the high fidelity uh, location? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that's a number of, uh, of access points, but could you maybe give us an idea of what well, that looks like? Yeah, and I'll, I'll let Ben get in a little more technical terms of, of that, but um, that's, you know, part of our secret sauce. And we have, we have a light version, and then we have a more kind of more complicated version, depending on the level of data that we want to uh, get um, but it's it's really all in in uh, some algorithms from uh, some of my team that are much smarter than me in building algorithms but uh, to try to figure out to filter out reflections and uh, you know exactly where that device is in real in real space um, one, just one of our access points even without without um, kind of honing in on on where they are in that space could determine uh, distance to our equipment so even in some ways that way, we can still say uh, with some level of, of um, accuracy where they are. Ben, do you want to elaborate on that? Sure. So as Jordan mentioned, we have multiple different uh, levels of fidelity and uh, what I like to call triangulation tracking. Um, and so really it all depends on the use case. Um, our access points have multi-directional antennas. And so uh, for a full-blown solution, uh, we would come in and just like standard triangulation technology, it would require at least three access points um, covering a given space in order to pinpoint, you know, where a particular uh, user was in that space. Obviously, the larger the space, the more access points that needed. And really, to get a, an understanding of what that deployment looks like, we need to understand what the floor plan looks like, um, layout of walls, construction of walls, um, and, and you know multiple floors uh, we can then you know create a mapping of that and then establish what that di what that distribution of access points needs to look at um, we have other lighter weight solutions that um, you can tell which action point it was closest to and in some installations that's sufficient to understand the general area where people are um, we are working on a, a number of different devices in our R&D lab uh, where we're hoping to get smaller kind of plug in uh, into the wall devices where you can install them basically in every office and you can instantly detect, you know, using that proximity detection for location awareness. Um, if it's closest to this particular one because it was plugged into this wall, then this is the office that they're in, right? Um, and then finally, with just a standard deployment, um, we're able to determine the distance from a particular, um, you know, a particular router. Uh, but again, without those three routers or three access points to determine triangulation, uh, distance is going to be more just a circular pattern. So we have multiple different ways to do it. Um, it all really just depends on how granular you want to get. And that determines the level of uh, kind of custom planning that needs to go into effect. Are you currently manufacturing or have a, a business partner that uh, is building a low cost tracker that I could effectively put on, say, going to a, an oil and gas well site? Uh, I like to slap that on a generator because they typically have a tendency of, since they've got wheels under them, 
Uh, people will go in in the middle of the night, hook up the back of that trailer, and, and pull a sixty thousand dollar asset out of there. Uh, do you do you have a, a are you building or are you working with somebody right now that would provide a low cost tracker um, to be able to determine that that's on the move? Um, you know, in, in regards to if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, um, I'm not sure that our technology would be the kind of the technology I would necessarily deploy on if, if, if we're talking about something that's outside and being dragged across the country somewhere else. Um, you know, there are, you know, there are GPS, you know, tags and stuff like that, that, that someone could follow them down the street and all that stuff. Um, our, our technology is hyper local. So unless our technology exists in that area, uh, or, you know, if it's, if it's deployed on a different level on an entire city grid, we can certainly do stuff like that. But once it leaves the zone of uh, our reach, then we're not following them around. So uh, let me, let me, let me build off that real quick. Um, so, so Jordan, Jordan is hundred percent accurate there. Um, but to expand on your use case, I think there might be something here where um, in terms of the partner that we're working with right now that uh, Jordan had mentioned earlier, we're not able to name, um, they are uh, building a tracker that does emit a system that can be placed on various different assets, um, equipment especially. Um, they can be self-powered or you know, they can hook into the power of the equipment and sort of a trickle charge and emit a signal. And then if the uh, nerve equipment was to be installed on site at those construction sites, um, we would be able to set up that detection in terms of, you know, if that particular piece of equipment has left the defined area um, through the, the hyper-local detection that Jordan mentioned. Um, and then, yes, we could alert to that and then, um, you know, hopefully prevent like you said, those people hooking it up to um, to a truck and, and towing away sixty thousand dollars worth of equipment. Yeah. So to to Ben's point, and that's that's a great point you're making, Ben. That um, we can act instantly activate the uh, if if there's any cameras on board or in the vicinity, we could send a instant notification to security that that uh, asset has moved, and then and then of course you can go into. Uh, you know the GPS once it once it actually does leave the facility. Does that I hope that answers your question? Yeah, I just uh, we're just kind of curious on just like you know partnerships and so forth. So speaking of partnerships, um, I'm just kind of curious as far as how much data is being shared between um, between your customers. So I think a good example is if I go into uh, you know our our uh, Home Depot um, favorite uh, customer here. And, and I give them all my demographics, uh, where I live, you know, age, uh, my personal identify as, <laughs> best way to put that, um, and so forth and so on. My question is, will that translate over to, say, McDonald's, if they've got your system there, uh, to whereas McDonald's isn't gonna know who I am, but they might get a report at the end of the month that says, uh, you had a, a green, a hundred-year-old green alien that came in on this particular date and was there for five, 15 minutes. You actually uh, nailed, nailed it right, right there. So there, there is, um, you know, there's, there's two sides to that answer. The, you know, the first answer is, um, you know, we wouldn't say that Gary Ramsey is here to McDonald's if McDonald, if you didn't authorize McDonald's to know that. Um, yep. But um, what we do attach to your profile, not only do we we have your demographics, but we also have um, levels of data like what business, what type of business category are you visiting most often? Um, if we're if we're tied in the point of sale, um, how much you're spending, you know, what you're spending your money on, and how often and when, how much, uh, different things like that, so that when you do go to McDonald's, let's just say in your example, we can share that um, the next level down. Of, of, of data, which is not, no PII, but um, you had someone that, you know, here, here's the mix of people that have come into your place that we, that we know of, uh, but we can't, you know, tell them, who, we won't tell them who you are, basically. Okay. Do you typically so, provide, say, an age range, um, you know, 10 to 15, you know, 100 to 140, 
uh, or is it specific data? I'm just curious. It, de what. it depends on what we're grabbing. So um, if there, if um, right now um, part of the registration process does ask for an age, uh, just to make sure that we're not communicating with a six-year-old, a twenty-year-old, a ten-year-old, or something like that in in uh, in settings where we shouldn't be, or that where they shouldn't be, right? So we we do collect that, um, and then of course, if they're doing any kind of single sign-on with a social social network or Amazon or you know something like that, uh, we'll we'll pull whatever data those companies are giving us. In some cases, they give the exact birthday. In other cases, it's a range. It's not generally as as wide as you're saying. It's generally like uh, you know, 18 through 25, 25 through 34, you know, stuff like that. So it's 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 within 10 years or so. Um, but you know, we're only you know, it's it's whatever data we can we we have now. We we're also in the process of deploying um, uh, bots that basically take the PI data that you give us um, and. Um, for lack of a better word, they're scraping the internet for anything that might match. So, uh, does Gary have a LinkedIn profile? Oh, what does he do for work? Uh, does he have a website? Does he own a business? Um, all these kind of different things, we'll start pulling. And this is just publicly accessible data uh, that you have either chosen to keep public, or it just is, but because it's public domain, uh, we're grabbing that and attaching as much data as we can on on that. Um, and that would even include things we integrate with, like. Uh, we haven't even talked about we can integrate with facial recognition cameras and knowing that when you walk in, are you happy or sad here? Or, you know, I mean, we can really go down rabbit holes with that. Okay. So, I mean, speaking of that, I guess I kind of look at your technology as no different than, say, uh, the license plate on the back of your car. I mean, that's public information. Anyone can take a picture of it. Anyone can, can record that data that I've got the car sitting out here at HEXA. Um, between a certain time frame, um, you know, absolutely nothing right. That. So, uh, your I guess your your, your personal identifying uh, your uh, your PI I guess is what you're referring to your PI that's uh, that's provided by your mobile device um, is effectively being uh, looked at the same way that your your public facing license plate number is uh, say it on your vehicle. It's hundred no. percent correct. So we can look at your, we can look at your. Someone could look at your license plate, um, and then you know, go down to the DMV or, or some other source. Not that I don't, I've never done this, but I'm assuming so. They can go down and probably pay a fee and find out who that who that plate belongs to. Um, you know, maybe whether it's a parking lot or, or whatever, or they're just simply taking pictures of. Okay, this car was here now, and so it's exactly right what you're saying. So um, that that level of data will never be protected by um, any kind of privacy law because it just you know once you're outside in the public view you're in public you're in the public view period you know so yeah. what what those places that own that parking lot or that facility um track with inside of it as long as they're disclosing it that hey i'm here and we're going to know you're here um it's no different than the security guard you know is, is doing a hand count and knows that you know knows everyone by name when they walk in yep okay um i just want to pause again here uh any questions there from the audience i've got one go ahead so i uh, see so you guys are uh you guys are a small business. Uh, what's your what's your down channel like, or what's your sales channel? You guys just doing direct, or are you guys open to any kind of distributor kind of? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, we we do sell direct, um, but we also um, you know Tim, who's who's uh, in the room there, um, he's part of uh, Red Fox Global Group, and they are one of our partners, um, and they are. Um, our exclusive master agent, if you will, and they um, they could sign up distribution partners that may um, uh, that may be a good fit, and uh, so that those people can also distribute our product. If if uh, if that answers your question, understood. Thank you. Uh, if you had any last comments at all, uh, anyone from the audience, any announcements, anything along those lines. Sorry, I've got one more question. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, please. Um, so the, the hardware, you guys have got the access points. So is there, um, I may have missed this, and I'm sorry, are there any other components, an edge device or some gateway or something that's required? No, so the, the devices themselves, um, they just need to get access to the cloud. 
Um, they do a lot of computing. Uh, we have um, our own firmware that we that we layer on to um, access points. Um, we, we're compatible with about 85% of the access points um, in the world right now. We do have our own OEM as well, so it depends on the application that they're looking for. But beyond that, um, there's nothing that needs to be installed on on anyone's phone. There's no download. There's no there's no extra stuff, right? Um, our clients get access to the cloud, a cloud-based portal where they can look at all their stuff and all the API, or we can send everything via via API to whatever technology they already have. Did I did I dance around your question or did I answer it? No, you nailed it. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I'll thank everyone uh, for joining us here for the meeting after the meeting, and uh, thank you. Uh, uh, nerd team for the uh, presentation today. It was very informative, and uh, we really appreciate your participation here in the uh, North Texas IoT SIG. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. And uh, Al, you're you're welcome. And just a reminder for everyone: the um, IoT Happy Hour uh, is coming up on the first Thursday of next month, uh, and we'll be uh, talking about the business side of IoT and hopefully talk uh, with the panel that we have. We typically have had some very lively discussions around uh, uh, issues of ROI and so forth when it comes to trying to justify and, 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 uh, and get uh, projects off the ground. So I'll conclude the meeting at this point. I appreciate everyone's participation, as I said earlier. Um, everyone have a great day. Thank you.